to uh, be talking. Oh. It is a great privilege to uh, be talking about cybersecurity, especially Cybersecurity Awareness Month, because that really focus around the people. And having Lean here with us, uh, it is really reflects that because Lean's focus, if you look at her 25 plus year career, it really focuses around the people. Um, you can also see on her website that she has a very busy schedule. So for us, it's a privilege to have Lynn uh, speaking about allyship as uh, uh, Cheryl, Cheryl already shared with us. Now, it is a very critical and important element um, for us, for San Diego State, for the CSU, but also for cybersecurity in general. Uh, allyship really helps us uh, to improve the gender balance in cybersecurity teams, and that cannot be overstated. Um, I don't wanna take any more time. I just wanna, again, uh, say thank you to Lynn. Thank you for this opportunity, and thank you to, for all of you uh, that's participating in this uh, webinar. Uh, give us your questions, uh, use the uh, uh, question and answer feature, and we will attempt it and try to answer those questions uh, the best way possible. Again, i uh, given to uh, Lynn Don, and the time is all yours. Oh, thank you so much, Ricardo. Thank you for the warm welcome and for San Diego State University for inviting me to be here today. I really appreciate Cheryl and Trisha from WISA San Diego Affiliate. Big shout out to you all for making this webinar come to life. Um, and to have me here about talking to myself. Hi, my name is Lynn Dome, and I am a smart woman. I know this because I've been introduced this way a hundred times over by someone I used to work with. And so it was really interesting to me because for all my male colleagues that entered into the meeting and the conversation, they were introduced by their first and their last name. But for me, I was introduced as Lynn Dome, being a very smart woman. Day after day, meeting after meeting, this is exactly how I was introduced, and it grated on my nerves. The first time this happened, I was like, oh, well, that was a little interesting. Yay me, I'm a smart woman. And then the second time it happened, I was like, huh, that's just a little odd because it was the very next day. And then day after day, meeting after meeting, I continued to be introduced that way. And it was just making not only me uncomfortable, but everyone around me because it was so blatantly obvious that I was the only female in the meeting and I was the only woman being introduced this way. Now, to be fair, I don't know if this gentleman that I used to work with, if he was introducing me that way as a way to compliment me or as a way to validate me being in that meeting. But either way, whatever the reason may be, it became work for me because I was the one that had to ask him to stop. And so it did. It was a habit, but after a while, he did stop introducing me that way. So allow me to reintroduce myself. Hi, my name is Lynn Dome. And it is a great pleasure to be here today to be talking about building a culture of allyship. Because what do you do sometimes in a perceived damned if you do, damned if you don't world that's sometimes riddled with unconscious and conscious bias, sprinkled with microaggressions, sometimes here and there, and upturned with layers of social injustices, lawmaking, and legislation, where women make up 51% of the global population, but yet roughly 20 to 24% of the cybersecurity workforce, where some teams aren't even seeing that. Where studies are coming out that nine out of 10 women and men are biased against women in the workplace. And then you layer that with Pew Research reporting that the average gender wage gap, that's women of all ethnicities, has only closed by two cents 
in the, over the past 20 years. So what do you do? Where do you even start? Well, for one, that's allyship. And the critical piece and important role it plays in driving the change in the workforce. So either you have entered today's webinar and you're here because you're interested in allyship and learning more as a cybersecurity professional or as an industry professional or as a student. And I'm so grateful that you're here to lead the change and to drive that information forward. So a little bit about me is that I first started paying attention to the word cybersecurity 15 years ago when I started working under a little known NSF grant called CASIA, the National Centers for System Security and Information Insurance. And I had some of the most amazing mentors, Dr. John Sands and the late Eric Spangler. But my role when I entered into the CASIA nonprofit not nonprofit grant, NSF grant, was to effectively communicate what they were doing as a grant so that others could understand it. And it was a great pleasure to work on projects like US Cyber Challenge, train the trainers, the National Collegiate Cyber Defense Competition, and build out many different diversity resources with the most fascinated individuals that I could have ever met. But I was instantly hooked on cybersecurity because everyone that I was working with was so incredibly hyper-focused on the good work that they were doing. The skills-based learning had so much intentional action on just doing the work that they were doing and competing in these competitions. Everyone was very um, intentional on working in such a fast-paced, ever-changing, ever-evolving, problem-solving environment. They were going out and having lucrative careers with 0% unemployment at that time and nothing but job opportunities. But yet there was this workforce shortage. And that was so interesting to me. Like, why would anyone not want to be in cybersecurity? And why in this fast-paced, ever-changing, problem-solving, curious building, curiosity-enhancing career, would anyone not want to be it? Why this critical workforce shortage? And why did we struggle to get more individuals into it? And so I tended then at that point to stay in this niche, niche area of the cybersecurity workforce initiatives. And it led me to many different NSF funded grants and nonprofits. And then I started working with the WESIS organization in 2015 as support capacity. But it wasn't until 2018 when I attended my first conference that my community was formed and my network was found. Up until that point, I didn't know what I was missing in my career until I had it. And when I was sitting at that keynote conference table and I met this network of incredible women in cybersecurity and having that network and that community and that camaraderie myself, I quickly advanced in my career. And then around August of 2019, I received a message from our founder, Dr. Amberine Siraj, who was at Tennessee Tech University at the time. And she reached out to me and asked me if I would consider applying for the executive director role within the WESIS organization. And I thought it was the first time in my career where I could merge my passion and my career into one. And so I've been in this role ever since. Let me go ahead. So the WESIS organization, we are women in cybersecurity, but you'll often hear me call by WESIS, and that's our acronym. It's pronounced WESIS, like we sisters, and it's spelled W-I-C-Y-S. But it's we sisters because we are a global cyber sisterhood. And our mission is to recruit, retain, and advance women in cybersecurity. We have over 8,900 members and representation in 95 countries. We have over 65 professional affiliates, and professional affiliates are extensions of the WESIS Global Organization. And they're all around the world, including throughout the continent of Africa and countries like Australia, France, India, Pakistan, the UK, Germany, Norway, the US, and so many others. 
And we also have specialty affiliates in AI, critical in infrastructure, cloud security, data privacy and cybersecurity law, LGBTQ plus pride, colors of inclusion, Latinas in cybersecurity, healthcare, neurodiversity, death, and so many others. And in addition to all of that, we have 236 student chapters with Microsoft Philanthropies funding a global student chapter initiative. But I think it's really important to note that we are not a woman's only organization. We're a community comprised of women, men, and non-binary individuals, allies, and advocates that are all concerned about the critical workforce shortage. We are concerned about the security of ourselves, of our families, of the companies we work for, and the communities we belong to. So therefore, we're concerned about the critical workforce shortage. Because when the World Economics Forum placed cybersecurity as the top 10 risks globally, we are concerned. And when some are estimating that the cybersecurity jobs will likely grow 31% annually until 2021, 2029, we are definitely concerned. And when ISACA in 2022, State of Cybersecurity reports that 69% of cyber teams believes that they are understaffed, we are concerned because quite frankly, we need more people. And so we know that there are two problems with building an effective cybersecurity workforce. You can't have diversity unless you have the pipeline, and you can't have the pipeline unless you're tapping into a diverse community. And that cycle keeps going around and around. And we also know that in order to solve challenges that have never previously existed before, we need all hands on deck. And that's not only genders, but identities, ethnicities, cultures, backgrounds, experiences, and more. We need to have that in order to solve challenges that have never previously existed before. And also to break up the group think mindset. Evidence shows that systemic errors are made by groups with all the same mindset. It provides the illusion of invulnerability because there's no alternative opinion to make the group think otherwise. And so that's why WESIS exists. In 2014, our founder, Dr. Amberine Siraj, who was at Tennessee Tech University at the time, reached out to NSF to receive some seed funding for the first ever Women in Cybersecurity Conference. The reason why is because when she was a student many years earlier, studying computer sciences, learning about cybersecurity, and loving what she was learning about, she was the only female in the classroom. And then you fast forward to this 2012, 2013, 2014 timeframe, and she's a PhD, a professor at the university, running a cybersecurity center, and she's still one of very, very few females within her classroom. And so she reached out to NSF because at that time came out a report that showed that women represented 11% of the cybersecurity workforce. Well, she wasn't seeing it in any of her circles of industry, academia, or government. And so when she went to NSF, she asked if women in cybersecurity exist, let's bring them all together in one location at a technical conference to learn and grow together. So NSF awarded her $70,000 with the anticipation of that of her engaging 250 women with that. Dr. Siraj was able to engage 900 women with that $70,000. And then when that money was done, she was able to network and connect with the right companies and communities that continue to grow that conference. So on the timeline, you could see that we were started in 2014, but you fast forward to the 2023 conference that happened this year in March in Colorado. We reached full capacity in less than a half hour of opening up registration. So this is how we started, and this is how we're going. But it's important to note that regardless of gender, we are the only cybersecurity conference that ensures equal representation of industry professionals and aspiring or underrepresented individuals. And how we do that is for every regular registrant, WESIS issues out a scholarship. 
So as women are coming to WESIS and growing and advancing in their careers because of us, we're paying it forward and building that pipeline, bringing them in, inspiring, empowering, giving them the content, the confidence, the network, and the community to move forward. And we owe all that thanks to our conference sponsors. Our 2024 conference is April 11th through the 13th. And the reason why I'm sharing this with you all today is because our call for participation and proposals and our poster sessions for students is open with that deadline, November 6th. We also have those scholarships that I was just mentioning. Those applications are open until November 6th as well. But in 2018, when we knew that the conference and the community was growing really strong, we decided to become a 501c3 nonprofit. And our mission remained the same with the recruit, retain, and advance women in cybersecurity. But what we do is now is we create opportunities and accessibility to cybersecurity. We layer it with resources, mentoring, and so much more. And we align it with all our strategic partners to cultivate this culture of inclusion, to give everyone a space in cybersecurity, a place where everyone belongs. And we do that through many different initiatives. We have our skill development training programs, scholarships, grants, and awards, not only to our conference, but other conferences as well. We have inclusion and allyship work or resources and workshops that I'll be talking about shortly, speaking in media opportunities because it's hard to be what you cannot see and representation matters. We have apprenticeships, internships, leadership series, leadership summits, speakers bureaus, our mentor mentee program, which right now we designed and developed a curriculum to upskill and uplevel women no matter where they're at in their career, preparing them for their next level of advancement. Because we know that as a mentee, you're five times more likely to be promoted. But what's interesting is as a mentor, you're six times more likely to be promoted. So within WESIS, we created resources to train the mentors to step into this leadership skill set so that they can lead their mentee cohorts with confidence. And we owe all that thanks to our strategic partners. We have close to 70 of them that invest in the industry, in the cybersecurity workforce, and create that inclusive space. But we're not here today to be talking about the pipeline. We're here to be talking about the leaky pipe because studies show that the average woman steps out of her tech career at the age of 35. And you layer that with the, with the data of college educated women reaching their highest pay growth potential at roughly 40 to 42 years old with men far exceeding that. So we don't have time to lose. And since we're a community of women, men, and non-binary individuals that are driving the change needed, we know that women, men, and non-binary individuals need to step into the space of allyship. Because women and underrepresented individuals are literally coached to be heard and louder. But don't you dare be aggressive. To be agreeable and accommodating but also strong leaders and to be assertive, but don't you dare offend anyone. All while softening the world with love, light and laughter, building better societies and communities, but not too much or else you won't be taken seriously. So either you're a woman in this presentation today in this webinar that has been coached with those resources or you're someone that has coached a woman or underrepresented individual with those resources, and that's okay. It's very important information, tools, and skill sets to know and build upon, but sometimes it gets uncomfortable. It is the first day of my daughter's fall semester, her junior year. Now, my daughter is five foot nine with long brown hair, and she is a sprightly skip in her step because she is so excited to get back into the classroom. And when she walks in, she realizes it's another all-male classroom of one of her advanced engineering courses. But she's super excited, and she goes and beelines front and center of the room, and she sits right in front of the program, uh, the podium, and, you know, pulls out her um, notebook and is just ready to rock and roll. 
And a few minutes later, the professor comes walking in and he comes into the classroom and sets his bag down on his desk and grabs out some papers and walks up into the front of the classroom up to the podium. And the very first thing that comes out of that professor's mouth as he looks at my daughter and then looks at everyone else around the room is I will not tolerate any sexual harassment in this classroom. Now, mind you, my daughter is the only female in this classroom, the only woman in this classroom. And the minute that she heard those words out of that professor's mouth, chills went down her spine because she knew that all attention was on her. And people in the classroom were all uncomfortable including her, likely thinking things like, well, why would the professor say something like that? Has she been sexually harassed before? Well, I don't want to be a person that's accused of sexually harassing her. So therefore, I'm not going to go anywhere near her. If my daughter could have shrunk any deeper within her seat and melted into the floor, disappearing into the earth forever at that moment, she would have. But she persevered. And she did so through extreme isolation and loneliness. She had no camaraderie and turned in the majority of her projects alone. And although she aced that class, she was done. She was absolutely done. And you know what? I, as her mother, was completely done for her. Because that one statement that that one professor said at that one moment was just enough to absolutely deplete her. And so the engineering world is missing a brilliant mind because of it. At WESIS, we know that the lack of diversity is a symptom of the lack of inclusion. And as the whole world keeps focusing on diversifying the workforce, we also know that sometimes in some instances, it can turn into a feel-good metric because it's a data point. It's a metric you can measure. You can measure it. And sometimes in some instances in organizations, that diversity metric is measured. And then you put in some initiatives and a year from now, you can measure it again. And if it grows ever so slightly, everyone could pat themselves on the back and congratulate themselves on their initiatives being successful. But very likely it was early career. And how was that sustained? But inclusion, inclusion is a more complicated of a topic and it's often avoided because inclusion is not this data point. It's not this metric. Inclusion is a feeling but it's mostly felt when you're excluded and it doesn't feel very good. Similar to how we're walking around and we're not feeling our bodies at all until we're in pain and then we feel them. Similar to how cybersecurity is always working. It's always working and it's always silent until it's not working and then you hear about it. So inclusion is incredibly important for our well-being, and that's why it's always talked about and referenced Maslow's hierarchy of needs and later psychologist Chloe Maidens um, that put together the six human needs for survival and that certainty, that's uncertainty, that's significance, that's connection, that's growth, that's contribution, that's inclusion, that's connection, that's belonging. These are the the, the needs, the human needs for life. And as leaders and industry professionals, if you're here attending today in this webinar, you are not unfamiliar with these needs. We exactly know what we need in order to advance in our career, what makes ourselves tick and tune in and tap into what our career advancement needs and where do we want to resonate and align. But it's important to listen and understand what influences others 
And according to Chloe Maidens, the way to long lasting satisfaction and fulfillment is through these last three needs, connection, growth, and contribution. And so that's why we CIS partnered with our researcher, Illyria, to measure inclusion so that we could quantify the experiences of exclusion to have metrics and data to identify the state of inclusion for women in cybersecurity. And we did so because we wanted to open up the doorways and the gateways to have these conversations with leaders, with industry leaders, because we also know that the higher that leaders rise, their, their experiences of exclusion are actually lessened because they're leaders in this space. And so how could we uh, assume that they have an understanding of inclusion when their experiences of exclusion are lessened. And we know that there's lots of data out there that supports this. Um, Accenture had their culture of equality in the workplace report, and there is a large gap from what leaders believe to be the sense of belonging, according to what employees in general believe to the sense of belonging. And in 2020, it was reported that if we cut this gap in half, it would boost global profits by 3.7 trillion US dollars, along with increasing work workforce ambition and empowerment. So once we partnered with Illyria and put together the state of inclusion assessment, we did the executive summary and it got a lot of media attention. And it's just a five or six page executive summary that you could find on our website if you're interested in learning and reading more. But I'll share with you today that some of the assessment, there was no surprises here. That women identified sources of exclusion stemming 68 from leadership, 50, 61 from managers, 62 from peers, 12% from policies. That's of no surprise. That aligns perfectly with all other industries, pointing at why we always say things like people don't quit their jobs, they quit their managers. But a key finding that bubbled right up to the top that we weren't even looking for, and a researcher was so enthusiastic to find and discover, was that those individuals that part participated in the state of inclusion assessment that identified as employees of WESA's strategic partners, our almost 70 strategic partners, had reported 36% fewer experiences of exclusion and 15% higher levels of satisfaction. And so that was really interesting to us. And when our researcher dove into that data a little deeper, they discovered that those individuals were part of the community effort. They had this community, the camaraderie, the place of belonging. They were included. They were part of the WESIS organization in one capacity or another. Either they participated in webinars or they were, they were presenting in webinars. Either they were a mentor in the program or a mentee. They volunteered either at the conference or they attended the conference. They were part of this growing, thriving entity that was all working and advancing in the workforce collectively and together. What was also interesting is that career and growth was the second highest area, 57% where women felt excluded in the cybersecurity workforce. And that was really interesting to Illyria, our researcher, because they haven't seen that in any other industry. But what was really the most intriguing finding is that women are experiencing a glass ceiling at around six years within an organization. And so when we have reports that come out like Gartner predicting that nearly half of the cybersecurity leaders will change jobs by 2025, we pay attention. And that's why WESIS continues to do all that we're doing and provide the resources that we have available. Because some might say, when we reflect back on the story of my daughter, that my daughter should have gone up to her professor and explained to him exactly how that one statement that he said made her feel. And I say, yes, and so should have everyone else in the classroom. We tend to put the ownership and responsibility of educating and advocating on the underrepresented individual himself or herself. 
Allyship is a leadership skill set. It's about paying attention and then being courageous to speak up. It takes practice because it's putting yourself in a place of vulnerability. And trust me, we all know allyship is sometimes uncomfortable, but it's a skill set that we all need to learn and grow and advance on. Because imagine how the outcome would have been different for my daughter if that professor just didn't say anything at all. Being pioneering for some sounds intriguing, but for others, it might be isolating. And so studies support that women keep women in STEM and having that community, that camaraderie, that, that network around you is so critically important. And that's why the WESIS organization continues to help build out these resources because creating an inclusive space for diversity to expand is truly empathy in action. Allyship is empathy in action. And it's about creating safe team environments, recognizing ideas and achievements. And whether you're an industry professional or a student here today, these are all things that you could create the space of inclusion around you. It's by providing valuable feedback and improving systems, processes, and cultures that are all around you. It's about interrupting the interrupters and doing no harm, leading the change and paying attention. And I share this with you so that you're not the individual, like some of the stories I continually and perpetually hear about. So you're not the moderator that continues to look at his watch when the only female presenter is speaking. And so that you don't become the senior manager that puts the newest hire headshot on the leadership slide deck and labels it diversity hire. Or so that you're not the professor that gives feedback on everyone else's in the classroom's elevator pitch but tells the only woman that her elevator pitch was on point, sheer perfection, but that her necklace and her nails were a distraction. Or that you're not the forever person, dreaded individual, that makes an assumption that mothers have less career advancement aspirations. And all these stories are not old news. These stories were gathered by me in person when I was speaking to individuals at Black Hat and DEF CON this year in August. <clears throat> and when I keynoted at the SAN Security Summit, Security Awareness Summit in September, a woman after the summit came up to me with tears in her eyes, sharing a story that she has declined every team event that her team has put together because she was a woman with a disability that made it in her unable to climb the stadium stairs. And all her team's event, her cyber team's events were at ball games and ballparks where she wasn't able to have the accessibility to. But what made her so sad is that nobody noticed that she was the woman that was always declining that. So we says, is here for the journey and for the investment and for career elevation. We put these resources together for allyship, how to be an ally for women in cybersecurity, inclusive leadership, how to create a neurodiverse event, and all of this for everyone here to consume and to take forward and live and drive the change that's needed. And we do so by so that we could continue to create accessibility and opportunities to cybersecurity. So we have the career advancement and provide a place where everyone belongs in cybersecurity. So that we could continue to have stories like Christine Morrissey, an HBCU grad that graduated as a physical therapist, was at the peak of her career, but just completely not where she felt she needed to be. Not having any technical experience, she saw, came across a WESIS LinkedIn post about the security training scholarship, and she took a moment 
of time to invest in herself. Knowing that it was an inclusive, safe space, and she applied for that, and she just so happened to have the aptitude, grit, and determination to move forward in her career because of it. And one year later, she was placed in her cybersecurity career because of it, after receiving advanced CN certifications. And she continues to grow and advance in her career, supporting herself, her family, and living the life that she deserves and wants and is enthusiastic about because of it. We provide these accessibility and opportunities to cybersecurity to reach individuals like Jenny Graham, who is a, a, an Army veteran. And every day she had three kids at home and she was going to work and she was working on cadavers. She even has a, 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 a statement about from bone dust to cybersecurity, but she was not happy. And she came across the WESA's Veteran Apprenticeship Program and took a risk on herself, joining forces with WESA's and diving in, applying for the program. And she herself had the aptitude, grit, and determination to move forward. And she moved on in her career, got a fantastic job, was able to move her family from Michigan to New York and, and continue to grow and advance in her career. These are the stories that within WESIS and within nonprofits that are working in the space like ours continue to hear. And that's what continues for us to drive force and move forward with the passion that we continue to do so. So when some say, why cybersecurity? Our community says we says. And I'd like to just finish off today's presentation with, with Louisa. I love Louisa. I love her story and the way that she just shares how WESIS and what it's made a difference in her life is just so genuine and authentic. So I'm going to go ahead and play this little video here. Why would you recommend this program to someone else? Um, because it's a life changer. This program is a life changer from beginning to end. Uh, I feel so fortunate to have been chosen to be part of this cohort, not only because I was able to fast track my cybersecurity knowledge, but also because I have met truly incredible women who taught me the true meaning of two super valuable lessons that people usually take for granted, which is believe in yourself and never give up. What? Louisa is just great. So I know I'm not the only smart person here in this webinar, this virtual world here today. I know this because so many of you came here and showed up today. And I shared a lot of information and I showcased a lot of resources that we have, but other nonprofits have this as well. As we continue to all work collectively, creating the ecosystem of driving the change. But my real question here is, how are we going to take this information and show up tomorrow a better version of ourselves because of it. So that all is for you to decide. And I'm just really grateful that WESIS and myself is here with you as part of that journey. So that's it. I would love to take some questions and that's really where the best part of the conversation comes into play is, is looking at the Q&A and answering your questions live. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen. and open it up for questions. That was an amazing presentation, Lynn. Thank you so much for that discussion. And I just wanna echo the good work that WESIS in general has been doing. I've been a member since 2017 myself. I attended a conference at that time and um, it's been just invaluable to my cybersecurity career journey. So if you have an interest in whatever stage you are in your career, I urge you to visit the WESIS website um, attend a conference and find a local chapter so you can find up, upcoming uh, uh, event opportunities just to meet uh, the folks there. So with that, we do have a couple questions from the audience. Um, one from Carlos Miranda, are these stats that you presented for all sectors, um, are all these stats for all sectors or it, and if so, how does higher ed stack up comparably? It is actually, I don't have the breakdown for how higher ed is stacked up comparably. So uh, Carlos, feel free to reach out to me, lynn at wesis.org, and I'd be happy to loop you in with our researcher. And I'll also show you where all the data could be found on our website so that you could pull that and we could go ahead and continue the conversation offline. So 
Thank you for that. Good question. Yeah. I wish I had an answer off the top of my head on that, but I don't. All right, we have another question from Jennifer Bate. Where does 25% in women in cyber come from? I have been in the industry for four years and frequently the only woman on a team of 20, 30, up to 50. Yeah, thank you, Jennifer, for that question. Oh, that is the ISC squared study. Um, and you could find that. And I could, and Jennifer, you could email me too at lynn at and I'll happily share that study with you. Um, whenever I share that and we have these conversations and I'm part of CISO panels and part of, you know, uh, facilitating conversations on inclusion and allyship. And we talk about that. Not many people are seeing that 20, 24% on their teams. Um, and we hear a lot of stories time and time again, even at the WESIS camp conference, when we have our allyship symposium and panel discussion, individuals are sharing that they're the only female of teams of 95 um, you know, it, it's really interesting. And so just know, Jennifer, that you're not alone. Uh, we hear that often. And um, that's why when WESIS was looking at how are we, what are we going to do different that's going to drive the change needed in the workforce is we know that there's many different organizations that are assessing like what is the diversity metrics within cybersecurity, but we wanted to take a different approach, peel back the layers ever so slightly and look at that inclusion. What is by being, what is the state of inclusion um, so that we could cultivate this space where more women know that there's a place where they belong and underrepresented individuals and we could all grow and expand from there. So thank you. All right, our next question is from Vivian L. Out of curiosity, how do you select scholarship candidates and are there any tips to be selected? So that's a good question. I am not part of the scholarship committee for a very good reason because I would open up the floodgates and I would let everyone in. But we are a nonprofit. And so we're likely going to have um, roughly close to a thousand scholar recipients at the next conference. And so, um, so Vivian, I hope that you check out our website and that you apply by November 6th. And the tips that I could share with you is just pay attention to the essay. Like, what is going to, how is this opportunity? You know, to Cheryl's point, she's been at WESIS in 2017 before I was even at the WESIS conference. My first conference was 2018, and it changed in my career advanced significantly because of that with only within a year's time of meeting that network and really having that strong support system around me. Um, so I really hope that you apply for that scholarship and that you get selected and that you just, when you're applying, pay attention to that essay piece and how would be attending WESIS change your life and help you out. All right, our next question is from Lorena Molina. Can I still join the mentee program? Is it still open? Actually, the Mentor Mentee program is a nine month program, so it is not open for enrollment right now. We do have other mentoring services. For example, if you are applying for, or if you're doing the call for participation for the WESIS conference, there are mentors there that help with the presentation, the title, the description, and they can help mentor you in that area. We also have resume reviewers that are available to folks, but right now the official mentor mentee program, the nine month program with the curriculum that's set up in the cohort fashion where we have 1600 individuals enrolled, that's not open right now, but we will in the new year. So if you're not already a member, I would encourage you to be a member because we always have ongoing opportunities, but um, definitely subscribe to our newsletter. All right. Question from Heen Hyun. Do, do you have any recommendations for resources for women towards a student loan repayment grant, et cetera, for career in cybersecurity jobs? I don't have any resources right now, like off the top of my head, but I would encourage you to go to our resources page on our website. We sometimes, we, we have partnership agreements with some universities, um, but we continually offer scholarships and awards to our own programming efforts and our own training programs. And some of those do have certifications as well with ISC Squared or Science Institute or Fortnet. So we continue to move forward with that. But um, and you, if you want to email me, uh, lynn at wesis.org, if there's anything else that I come across, I'll be happy to share that information with you. 
Next question is from Kelly. Hi, I've been in tech for six plus years, but moved into cybersecurity about two years ago. This is my first WESIS meeting. I'm really happy to have found this group. What companies do you see making big investments or are great places for women to work in security? My first thing, I'm happy to find this group. What are companies? Well, if, if, or great places for women to work in security. So Kelly, on our website, if you go to wesis.org, there's a tab that says support. And the first drop down from there is strategic partners. That gives you an idea of the strategic partners that are investing in the industry. What's really unique about those partners, and there's close to 70 of them. So when I started four years ago, there was about 10 of those strategic partners. And not only has that partnership continued to grow up, Every year, but those original intent can continue to come in at a higher capacity as all you know partners are doing. And so they're really identifying that the industry needs the investment in in order to create the inclusive spaces that are necessary to drive the change that's needed, create more diversity in the cybersecurity workforce, and fulfill that workforce shortage that we have right now. Again, going back to you can't have diversity unless you have the pipeline, you can't have the pipeline unless you have diversity. What's really unique about those partners and those individuals that are there is they're investing annually into WESIS so that we could pay it forward to our community. But they they themselves are an ecosystem. They're this multi-organization approach that have all come together. So all those strategic partners meet every other month. And I have the great fortunate pleasure to be able to meet with them every other month. And we have conversations because my role as a nonprofit is to listen to the needs of our community and to build out programming efforts that make sense for our employer partners. So those partners play a very important role for what I do within the nonprofit space, but also they're continually there. So they're they're there for you all. I mean, they're all, they all are part of our job board plus plus. They're all part of our virtual career fair. If you could put your resume into our job board, those partners can pull from it. You could go into the job board and you could look at all the um, jobs that they have open and available right now. One of, one of my, I mean, we hear so many incredible stories how WESIS has really just, just having that connection in that community and that bond of the WESIS organization is so valuable. But one of our, um, one of our board members shared that as, as she stepped into her new CISO role, her very first hire was a WESIS member. And it came up that way because all these resumes came across her desk and then came one with the WESIS part of the mentor mentee program and the conversation led and extended itself from there in the interview. And she ended up being that CISO's first hire because of the thread of WESIS. So continue to like navigate through, go to our job board, join one of our community efforts, volunteer in some capacity, join a programming effort, become a part of a cohort, be on the part of the speaker's uh, you know, uh, uh, the speaker program and so many others. And I know uh, Joanna is here and she leads our book club. Join our book club. Join the WESA San Diego affiliate. Look at all these different packets and cohorts and areas for the community to come together collectively. That's what we need. That's the support of the organization. It's just not one isolated thing. It's the collective strength of everything. So... We do have a question from Joanna. How can I get more men to step up as mentors in the field? I know so many men, but I'm not sure how to reach them in an effective way or start the conversation. Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, with with WESIS, it, it's really interesting. Um, and I think our mentor mentee program is a nice conversation starter and a gateway to that. We hear stories over and over again of men that have come into our mentor mentee program feeling a little apprehensive themselves because allyship is hard. And you don't just like, for example, all those, you know, men in my daughter's classroom, it's like they didn't know what to do. That professor clearly made it uncomfortable for everyone there. And so, so it's like, where do you navigate to this? But in our mentor mentee program, we found that that helps really um, start the conversation on uh, getting more men actively involved because we have the resources for them to focus on in their mentor mentee cohort. And so it kind of removes the barrier or the uncomfortable of where do I even start Start this conversation. But what was really interesting, and I don't know, uh, Cheryl, if you remember that we started our mentor mentee program back in 2020 in the middle of the pandemic. We did it prior to that, but it was just a matching system. And it really, we, we didn't feel like it was very effective because people weren't moving forward with it. 
because after a while it kind of got uncomfortable. Well, where do we even start this conversation? That's why we put together these resources. But now that we have more and more men, CISOs and you know, VPs of security, and they're all paying it forward, they all want to know what can I do with for for to be an ally in women in cybersecurity and be a part of the WESIS organization, they step into this mentor space and those resources kind of you know, make it the, them comfortable with the uncomfortable. But the story I want to share with you is that I always continuously hear that these men as leaders in the space, a year later, after being a part of the WESIS Mentor Mentee Program, they're a part of conversations that they normally never would have had before. But because they were a part of the programming effort themselves and they learned from their mentees by sharing the resources and being a part of those conversations, it was empathy and action. They actually showcase empathy and action with their mentor co mentoring cohort program that they were able to lead in a direction that they never even imagined that they would step into these conversations that they would normally avoid in the past. And so we are really, truly growing a community there. Um, and at the WESIS conference in 2024, the April 11th through the 13th, we are going to have a male ally um, uh, symposium, like a breakfast and symposium, creating an inclusive space for men to come and get involved. And so they, they could learn and grow collectively in this space too. So we see progress. That's a really, really positive thing. All right, next question is from Camille. For aspiring cybersecurity computer scientists who are either just beginning in their journey in learning slash working about the field, what resources do you recommend to help make the journey easier? I like that question. I just was asked that um, for an article and I, I shared to dive in, you know, just to take away these preconceived ideas that it's going to be so straightforward. Don't put so much pressure on yourself. Know that the curiosity that lends you from computer science into cybersecurity or whatever your journey was into being interested in cybersecurity, that, that curiosity is going to continue to lead you through your career advancement as you're navigating through it. And really defining where you want to align within the cybersecurity workforce. There's so many areas for you to go. And so instead of having any barriers or being rigid about, I need to be this straight path here, just dive in in many different ways. You know, you could do your educational pathway, but then you could be a part of WESIS and hey, do the target cyber defense challenge, learn something new like threat intel and malware analysis. And why not? Because we're creating these opportunities for the safe space for you to learn and grow or be a part of, you know, come to WESIS and dive right into the National Cyber League CTF competition, knowing that everyone there is to help one another in that space. And maybe you will find something else that really strikes your interest and you tune in and tap into that and move forward in that avenue moving forward. So just continue to navigate and, and really just pay attention to what WESIS has to offer and just jump into those different type of opportunities for fun. And you'll be surprised on where it'll take you. Next question is from Tracy. Are there any volunteer spots currently open with WESIS? And I see that Joanna with our San Diego affiliate has already provided a, a good website for that question. All right. And then the next last question is how do I register? Actually, there's two more questions. How do I register to become a member? And again, thank you, Joanna, for providing a good link mm -hmm. on how to be a member of the WESIS organization. And a few more questions. Cam Camille, for those that have no experience in cybersecurity yet, would software projects still look good on resumes in the, in, in the attempt to get a cybersecurity internship? Well, with no experience at one, we have resume reviewers that could certainly help you with your resume. Um, and so you could email me, lynn at wesis.org, and we could talk through that. But another thing is that all these different skill development training programs that we do, these are ways for you to gain experience for you to speak to the knowledge that you've learned in these opportunities. So again, going back to diving in, you can gain different experiences through many different avenues. And so there's there's um, all sorts of different ways of engaging. And also I would encourage you to apply for a scholarship because what we do is we wanna bring individuals to the WESIS conference that are just so interested in cybersecurity because we know that the conference experience itself 
will ensure that hopefully you will stay into that cybersecurity, um, you know, the educational pathway. Um, but it will, it will put, there will be so much content, so much opportunity for you to be a part of the CTF competition, to have in that network, and uh, just to learn throughout the, 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 the conference experience. So one, join in. We're going to be opening up doors for many different programming efforts. So make sure you subscribe to the WESIS newsletter and dive into those experiences. Two, Right now, apply for the WESIS Conference Scholarship so that you can get there in 2024. And then three, join forces in the WESIS San Diego affiliate, um, connect with Cheryl and Trisha and uh, Joanna and so many others that continue to do this good work um, and you know just be a part of the, the thriving entity that we are. And one last question is, and you, you've already addressed some of this, Lynn, but how do I build my network if all the events I see are online? I have a WESIS account, but I don't know how to take advantage of it. Any advice? Yeah, so Lorena, when we have many different programming efforts, so there's lots of different ways. Uh, um, there's an, a lot of events are online, yes, but a lot of events are in person too. So you have to look at our, our global calendar of events that's on our website and jump into where your interests are. So not only do we have the regional affiliates like WISA San Diego, but we have those in cloud security, AI, critical infrastructure. You could attend those virtually. You could attend the regional events locally. You could attend a student chapter events that are hosted locally, um, you know, definitely come to the WESIS conference, but also becoming a part of WESIS is we, we are always pushing out to our membership opportunities to go to various conferences. And so receive one of those scholarships and head on out to another in-person conference and really scope out what's going on. We have a lot on our calendar for events, but we can't include everything. Sometimes we miss things. And so um, if there's an event that we're, that we should definitely have on our radar and we should definitely have representation at, we will have it on our calendar or bring it to our attention. So. Awesome. And just to add to that, we, uh, the, the San Diego affiliate, we are trying to do more in-person events as where we join up with other cybersecurity organizations in the area and, and do mixers. There's a leadership um, opportunity, meet and greet coming up. So um, there's a lot of in-person events coming up as well. All right. And one, I, and one last question from um, Brian Shaw. Thank you for your time today. Do you play any of the instruments on the wall behind you? <laughs> no, I don't, Brian, but I've invested a lot of money into my three children that are now all, all in college. And so when they all left in college, I'm officially an empty nester. And I redid this office. I thought all that investment of all those years and nobody's playing an instrument anymore. I'm going to decorate my office with them and make a beautiful art display. So I'm glad you saw them and appreciate them. We have many, many more. We have tons of fiddles, tons of um, mandolins and guitars and 16 strings. I don't even know what, but I play the ukulele. So I just, I lay down low. I, you know, play a little ukulele around the campfire every once in a while. And even at that, sometimes that goes missing because a college kid will come home and decide to take it to their dorm with them. So, you know, you know how it is. <laughs> One more question. Lynn. question. Yeah. One more question, Lynn. Can I start a WESIS club at my college and who do I contact? I don't know how many will be interested. Yeah, you just need a launching pad. So absolutely, you need one interested. That's you. That is you. I was on a call. Oh gosh, I wish I knew what college it was in New York. Um, I was on a call with a faculty advisor there, and he said the minute that WESIS that the that they had a WESIS student chapter on campus, that his cybersecurity program grew so significantly because one person was bringing a roommate, and the roommate might have been in psychology or biology, and they were they would come to the WESIS student chapter meetup and we're funded to fund you to host events um but they would come to the, the the chapter meetup and they would decide to come into cybersecurity and so their program continued to grow so it goes like you cultivate the culture of inclusion and diversity will expand so please start that student chapter you will be the launching plan but what's also interesting is you get a very you get a guaranteed scholarship to the WESIS conference by being the president of this student chapter you also are part of a global student chapter leadership team now that meets once a month. So you're extending your reach outside of yourself and you're really growing your network. You're going to be prioritized for internship opportunities. It's going to be on your resume as a student chapter president. You're going to make connections with your faculty advisor. 
you're going to connect with your local professional affiliate, you're going to share your experiences and, and you'll be doing presentations and we says moving forward. So it's a really wonderful, powerful experience as a nonprofit. We're here to fund that and support that for you. So please reach out to Lynn at WESIS.org. I will introduce you to Kiana. She's our student chapter lead, and she will just ease us easily and seamlessly get the ball rolling for you. And one last question I saw this before is, can we get a copy of your presentation today? Absolutely, Cheryl, I could send it to you if Perfect. that's okay, and then you could yep. share it with others. Absolutely, and I can also make this recording available on uh, the security site for SDSU. But that wraps up the Q&A portion for today. So I want to thank Lynn, and on behalf of San Diego State, you have an open invitation to come back anytime um, and join us for, um, in support of cybersecurity awareness. So thank you, Lynn. Thank you to the attendees for coming here today. Um, thank you to everyone that's helped and uh, have a great week, everyone. Yeah, thank you, Cheryl. Thanks for inviting me. Really appreciate it. Enjoy the conversation. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye.